yesterday, and then this morning I got up with a bad knee. So, um, first of all, uh, I, I have you have here my PowerPoint presentation, but I just understand that they didn't, you know, because of uh, this uh, the facility, they couldn't bring the they couldn't bring the, the, the projector. So, but you have pretty much everything here. So I'm gonna go over it, over everything here. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me, Alan, and the USPTA. Uh, I understand the uh, Georgia Georgia Board. Uh, my presentation is in maximizing your your, uh, your students' potential. Uh, I uh, you know I started to play tennis at four years old, and I became pretty pretty good, I guess, when I was by the time eleven. I played Davis Cup for Venezuela when I was 15, and I played, you know, for, for many years, I played for 18 years for Venezuela Davis Cup. I was captain the last two years that I lived, that I lived in Venezuela. I was able to play at a higher level. Uh, it was a different day and time than, than, than what is now, but, you know, uh, uh, these things were good then, and now I have adjusted to probably what is good now, so I'm gonna go over some of these things with you to, give you an idea of what do I think and hopefully help you to maximize your, your uh, student's potential. So in the first slide here, the, the coach's role. What is the coach's role? Is you know first first to help the kids with the for the love of the game, optimi optimization of their body, the best possible techniques, strategy and tactics, nutrition, to play at the highest level, emotional and mental preparation, and the team and the environment that they should have to, 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 uh, to, uh, to help them realistically reach their, their potential. We, as a coaches, we are not experts in every single of this area, but we need to be involved in order to make sure that our kids reach the maximum potential. In some areas, you might have very little to say, but at least you need to be aware of what's going on with your player, okay? And in other areas, you're gonna have probably maximum involvement, especially, let's say, when they are on the court or when they are preparing, preparing for a tournament. I'm gonna start with the love of the game because I think everything starts in there, okay? I think when we find kids with passion for the game. That's one of the key ingredients that they need to maximize, maximize their the, the potential. A, a lot of times that passion do not come for a while, or we might not see it at the beginning. But we as a coach gotta make sure that especially that first experience that the kids have on the court with us, the first experience that they have in competition, it could be something as simple as a play day or a, or a junior team tennis, a, a junior team tennis uh, being part of the team or an entry level tournament. It's our job to, to make them have a great experience for us to help them bring that passion at an early age. Sometimes the passion, the passion doesn't come for a while. Do you guys agree with me that a lot of times the parents are the one, hey, you know, I play tennis, I would like for you to try the kids sometimes, you know, they're there because the parents want it. But, you know, if we help them find that passion, we are doing our job, and who knows, you might have somebody there that is super talented that could reach a highest le the highest level, or our goal realistically should be for these kids to make tennis their lifetime sport. So, so help them find the passion. The love home for competition. This is something, this is something that is tough in tennis, okay? Because when we play tennis, you know, and you, you compete, one person is gonna win, one person is gonna lose. There is no tie in tennis like other sports, like soccer, for example, you know? And, and, and other sports you can tie. Uh, the, 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 the competition, I think, is one of the driving force to make those kids to reach their potential, and they need to be they need to be 
be taught from an early age that as long, I will talk a little bit about that this a, a, a little bit later, but if we can get our, our players to, 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 to love competition, win or lose, based that if they gave 100% emotionally, mentally, and physically, when they come out of the court, okay, winning or losing, hopefully the second day. So I will talk a little bit more about when we talk about the mental preparation. Okay. And then willing, willingness to improve and adjust. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the, the kids, you know, they want instant gratification. They want to be able to go ahead, go on the court and you know be able to hit the ball right away. And we know tennis sometimes it's not that easy, but our our job is to make sure that that, that, that they learn, you know, from an early age to improve and also to adjust, not to be playing, you know, the, 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 the same way throughout, throughout their, 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 their career, their junior career. Next, I got the optimization of the body. Um, uh, when I was, when I played on the tour in Venezuela, I was lucky enough that at one stage, the I guess this is the right translation. The Institute National Sports asked me to be the guinea pig, the big, the, be the guinea pig for them to, 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 to try some of the highest level preparation. Uh, on those days, you know, we didn't have that many people that specialized. So, so what they did, you know, they had somebody that went to Germany to, 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 to specialize in the sports, in sports medicine. And, and that person asked me to, you know, to give me a test based on sports, not based on, you know, uh, open your mouth and you know, check, check everything. I mean, I started, you know, with a blood test and then I, at the highest level, because what he was trying to find out, it was, if I was, if, it, if I was 100% fit, fit physically, not tennisically, to play at this highest level, okay? That, that, uh, 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 that testing that they did also included a, a full eye examination based on the sport, based on reaction, things like that, and then full dental, you know, that because, you know, sometimes you have something, the kids might have something in, in the dental area that is not what we would like. And when they did that, I'm gonna mention specifically my, my, about myself. When they did that more specific, specific uh, uh, testing in my dental side, they found out that my core, my, my wisdom teeth, my wisdom teeth were a little bit too, too uh, 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 grabbing in a certain area, and then that would create some extra tension here and. You know, when I surf too much, and if I play a long match, I have a lot of tension here. When they used to give me the massage, I used to have a lot of tension. And they found out that, so I had that taken out after a while with that. This is what I tell you. You know, you guys might not be a dentist or an eye doctor, but if you have kids playing at the highest level, they should get a full physical. I would recommend at least a year and make sure that they get they get their eyesight tested and their, uh, 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 and a full dental dental testing so to make sure that they have any weakness. Okay. Also, very important, especially nowadays with, with how how physical have become the game of tennis, is injury prevention. Okay. When I went to this test many years ago. Uh, uh, Mark mentioned before, they found out that I had a little bit of weakness in my ankle, especially in my right ankle. I twisted, I have, by that time, I have twisted my ankle a couple of times, and of course, because, because of that, you know, I had to do extra, extra preparation for that. But after, when they found out that, they gave the right exercises, they did the right injury prevention, and I still had weaker ankle, but I never had an injury like I had when I was, one time I had a major injury playing Davis Cup when I was 16 years old, and then I had an, another big injury when I was in college, I think I was maybe 20, 
went one in my right ankle. Both times was in, in my right ankle. But after with all the exercise and the injury prevention, I was able to do a lot better when I was on the tour. I felt a little bit weakness every so often, but I, like, like I said, I never had a, an ankle injury that prevented me not to play for weeks like I did, like I did with, with I, I was, I was yeah, you know, Also, it's very important, you know, for, for, for these physicians to find out also the strength is of the possible weakness that your players might have. Okay, I go again, you guys might not be directly involved in that, but this is something that if you want to help your players reach your max, maximum potential, you should have some kind of involvement and have some kind of, some, 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 some kind of suggestion for the parents or the people that are in charge of these kids. So that way, you know, they are not training for months and months and all of a sudden they get an injury that it would be prevented or it would have been strengthened before they become, it becomes a, 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 major, a major situation for them. Now, the next, uh, the next um, uh, slide on my, on my presentation would be the best possible techniques. And this is where we, where we get more, more involved, okay? I truly believe, I truly believe, uh, and I know not everybody still agrees, that two years ago when the USDA went and did 10 and under tennis, that they did the right thing. The IPF has done it for many years, and other countries have, have worked on that for many years. And, and basically, you know, basically when we went to 10 and under, what, what the USDA was trying to create a bigger base of players, so we, we have a pyramid, we have the bigger base, and then we could peak at the top. And, and it's still, it's still, it's still a work in progress, but I think it has worked, it has, it, it, it's working pretty good if you use what, what we are supposed to use. Basically, when you have kids 10 and under and they are introduced, you know, I think the key for them is to learn to rally and play. Rally and play, so that way they can rally and learn. Okay, the technique, the better it is, the better, the better it would be for for the future. But at that stage, at that stage, that technique is going to change quite often as they they grow old. Um, also, if when they are thin and on there, we got to make sure that they de develop the right athletic system. Okay, that is not only not only a, a, a to, 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 to rally and play, but try to try to start developing a complete game, even though they are 10, 10, 10 and under kids and they might be playing on the 36 foot court on the 10 on, on, on the, on the uh, uh, 60 foot court with the red balls or the orange ball, that they can develop you know a full game playing playing at the highest level at the at the at the, uh, at the um, uh, age that they are playing. Um, I gotta tell you this short story, okay? Uh, I run the Southern Tennis East at my facility. We just ran, ran, ran it during Southern the Father's Day in June. And uh, a few years ago, and some of you might know him, uh, the best tenant on the boy or girl that I've seen, his name is Josh Rapp. He won that tournament. He won, the, he won the Southern Tanks, I want to say, two or three years ago. I saw him last year at the Junior Tennis National Championship, and he told me that he's from Georgia, he's from North Georgia. Uh, he told me that he was number two in the country in 14 and on. So he had run and all that. But what it, caught, what it caught my attention a few years ago with Josh is when I watched him play, okay, I would watch his footwork. And to me, to me, he simulated a, a mini feather. His strokes were fantastic. You know, even though he was a, a, a 10 year old, I could see a 10 year old that in the future could be a great collegiate player or even a professional player. And up to now, he, he is in the right path. Like I said, I think this is last year was his first year in the 14, and he was already number two in the nation in the 14 and under. Unbelievable well around player and he's somebody that started at, in the tanks that year. If I'm not mistaken, he only lost two games in the whole tournament. 
the day that he was going to play the final, he said, Josh, you are so good. Why did you play the 10 and unders instead of moving to the 12? You're playing number four in Georgia. You could have played in, in the 12. And he says, I believe, and my coach told me that if I play the 10 and under, I would develop better, and it would be better for me for the future. So that, you know, that came through, came through for, for Josh. So, okay. So, repeating again, the 10 and under, I think we as a coach, we want to give them the best possible overall game, but the key for them would be to, to do as much rallying and playing, so they can rally and learn. So that's the basic, what I think in the 10 and under. In the, in the 12 and under, one of the things that is key, okay, for the 10 and under, uh, the, the difference between the 10 and under and the 12 and under is realistically in the 10 and under, the most consistent player, the person that pushes the ball the most, is going to win. In the 12, now you, can have, you got to start developing a more all around game. You need to try to start developing a, you know, a little bit more offensive shots. When you have the right ball, you gotta you gotta hit it with a little bit more pace, and you gotta you gotta be able to hurt the opponent with your with your shot more often. So the technique start to become more more important. One of the things that I think we need to as a coach is develop very at a very early age, and I would suggest as early as 12 and under is that offensive second serve. Most of the kids that I have seen, you know, in the last few years, basically what they do, they have a decent first serve, but they have what I call a push second serve. And they should develop an offensive second serve, okay? What is one of the best ways to develop a second serve? Number one, to have a very good technique, so this is where we can get involved, okay? Number two, is practice a specific second serve. There are many, many ways that you can practice second serve, and you can create game as, you know, playing only as, as a second serve, okay? I'm gonna tell you again one of my own stories. And when I was, when I was uh, 16 years old, I already have won the national championship of men's in Venezuela. I was playing Davis Cup already for, for, for Venezuela, and the two other, there were two other teammates of mine in, in the Davis Cup team. On, this, on those days, we didn't have four, we had three, we had only three of us that could play Davis We had a four team when we played, when we played in Venezuela. We, we traveled, and we traveled some other way, the, the federation didn't even bring a four. And those two other, other players were already in the United States in college. So in Venezuela, for a while, until I graduated for about a year and a half, I didn't have too many people to play. I had to play the people with handicap, you know, even, even uh, fairly low in each game and things like that. I won one year, I'm not sure if I'm proud to say this, I won one year my club championship. I won three rounds, and I didn't lose one, one game in the whole tournament. One game, it was my club championship. I won three matches, and I won all three matches, six love, six love. And, you know, I didn't have too much competition. The only thing that I could do similar to what I was gonna do when I was playing the other way was, was practice serve. So I used to practice, even when I was uh, 16 years old, I used to practice somewhere about 150 serve a day. And I would practice specifically my second serve because I was a serve ball here. And that was the key, I think, at that, at that day for me to, to succeed. So, okay. Also, when we, we as a coaches, we want to be very aware of this, uh, uh, you know, uh, when developing techniques, is that the girls at 12 years old, some of them a little bit younger, they start developing. And something in the stroke that we might be working, it might not, it might not work if they start developing, you know, getting taller and getting, you know, bigger in certain places like they were before. Their footwork, their movement, their recuperation is not the same. So this is that we as a coaches need to, need to be need to be aware. Okay? And when we move to the to the 14 and under is where I think we as a coaches we gotta make sure that our kids are what I call a multi-dimensional dimensional players. 
What is a multi-dimensional player? He's somebody that can play singles, somebody that can play doubles, somebody that can play mid doubles, somebody that can play on hard courts, on clay courts, on indoor courts, on grass, and any other surface that, that, that we have, okay? That is somebody, is somebody that, that can start adjusting to the different situations that it's gonna present when they play older players that might be better or younger players that might not be as good as, as good as them. Okay. Some of the 14 years old that I have noticed recently, they are very good when they hit hard with somebody, but sometimes when somebody eh, 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 hit moon ball to them, they might not be as good. They are, they are not used to that anymore. They were more used in the tanks and maybe a little bit in the 14, in, in the in the 12, but not so much so much in the 14. So we as a coach gotta make sure that our kids are multi-dimensional players and try to find opportunity for them to play against better players, but against against lesser players so they can adjust to the different 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 conditions. Okay. Um, also at the 14, we as a coach is gotta make sure that they start very shading, that's a tough word for me to pronounce, between offense and defense, okay? A lot of them, they just want, like I mentioned, they just want to play offense all the time, and they don't know how to play defense. Some of them, when the opponent comes to the net, they, to the net, they can identify that a lot might be better than trying to, to, to drive the ball through them, so that's important. And at the same time, you know, sometimes you, you're, you're playing offense, you gotta change to defense for one or two balls and then come back to offense. Uh, and that's expected. And sometimes, you know, playing defense, the opponent is gonna be himself or, their, or, or herself by himself and they can identify that. So we as a coaches need to help them to understand, understand that situation, okay? And um, in the 16 and under is add more variation for the game, okay? I know, I know that, that the, the, the kids, they have a certain way that they play, and they wanna, they wanna mandate that to most of, the, most of the kids. But by 16 years old, they should realize that sometimes changing a little bit the game is gonna work a little bit better, better for them. A lot of times, you know, they, 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 the people get too stubborn and they play only one way, and they don't realize, or, they, they might win the match, and they might feel that they played terrible because they couldn't adjust to the other conditions of, 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 of the other play. Um, also, it's very important to continue to continue improving their strengths, okay? Continue improving their strengths and improve their weakness so they can they can become an all-around player. Some of these some of these. Uh, uh, 16 year old players, you know, already are, are big and strong and they're playing, they're, they might be playing in some adult tournaments, some, some, some ITF tournaments, some national tournaments, so they need to adjust to all these things. Oh, one thing, uh, I just saw in my notes here, uh, you know, in the 14 and under, in the boys is where we need to start watching when they start developing and when they start getting stronger, taller, Happier and uh, 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 also emotionally, you know, some of the some of the situation situation change. Okay. By the time by the time they are 16, okay, they still they still kids, but they start playing a lot of adult adult players. So when they when they are 16 years old, they should be an all-around player so they can start moving into the adult game and continue being successful if they are successful. Some people develop a little bit later and they might have a good base when they were before and then they start seeing the results after they become fully developed and they move into the, into the, into the adult game. Okay, uh, now I'm gonna talk about strategy and type and type, okay. There are different type of games. We, we all know that. And, you know, I bought some photo and I, these are part of my presentation. 
Starts of playing that they are out there with our with our with our uh, players. Baseline, baseline, baseliner. Okay, very good. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Serve and volley. Not too many here left, but we got you get the pink one. Okay, counter puncher. Very good. Okay, so I have I have two more, but I couldn't find it. If anybody else can tell me, I'll give it to you when you say. What, what else do we have? A scrambler. A scrambler? Okay, or it, it's also like a, I'm a looking at it, I'm a doctor. Okay. So we have, we have, we have different game of players, okay? So, so you know, we need to, we need to help our players become better for what they do good, but at the same time, we need to work with them often in the areas that they need to improve. So this is where we, as a coaches, we can help them, help them in doing that, okay? Second, uh, in strategy and tactics. I call it, we as a coaches need to show them and help them to play to win, not to play, not to lose, okay? I'll give you an example, somebody, is winning and you know have been winning let's say serve and volley okay being a, a, an attacker baseliner and he gets to 5-4 has won the, the, the first set 6-2 has been gets to 5-4 in the second in, in the second set and he changed completely they try to keep the ball in play so they play what's called not to lose okay and you know there is a saying that we know you never, you never change a winning game. You always try to change a losing game. And we as a coach, it's something that we need to aware because a lot of, a lot of our players, sometimes they don't know how to close because they don't play to win. They play not to lose. So that's an important part for, for us to know. Okay. Knowing how to adjust the game, you know, sometimes they are winning one way like I said before, and the opponent decides to start to throw moon lock, a moon ball. And they can handle the pace, but they cannot handle that, that kind of situation. And I tell you this, and I, he, he just retired recently. One of my fair, favorite players of, of all time, uh, Fabrice Antoine for, from France. You guys seen it? See Fabrice Antoine? He was somebody that could adjust to different, different situations. And the players in the tour, I didn't talk to anybody or anything like that, but I can feel they hated to play that time. Because he always was changing the situation. You know, he would serve on volley sometimes, he would throw you that slice on both sides, sometimes he, hit, he hits hard, sometimes he starts throwing moon, lock, moon ball. So he was one of the players that he was fantastic to watch him play because he had so many different weapons. What he didn't have was power, he didn't have too much power. So he, was, he had to use all these all these kind of, kind of different things. So we need to help our kids and show them and work with them on how to adjust to the, to the game. Also, one thing, this one is, is, is in relation to, 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 to play to win, is never change a winning game, okay? Never change a winning game. How many things, how many times, uh, uh, times this has happened? A kid is winning, playing one way, and all of a sudden he or she start thinking about the next round and he said, well, you know, in the next round I'm gonna play such and such and I gotta start hitting more drop shots well, against that person. And they start changing the situation and all of a sudden they change the win combination. So we as a coaches gotta be aware, aware of this. This is not easy. That's what we need to be involved in, 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 in the way that we play. And that's why it's so important for us to see them play every so often to see how they're doing because one thing it might be when they are when they when they are at your facility you know hitting with you or hitting with somebody that they're used to that when they play against somebody completely different okay and well i'm mark i'm glad that mark talked some of this point because my next one is superb physical fitness 
me tell you uh, about this. Uh, uh, two years ago, my wife Anna uh, gave me as a present the book Rafa, and she gave it to me in Spanish, so you know I could see the, the whole situation. Has any of you read that book? Strongly recommend. It. Don't you agree with what's your name, please? John. John. Do you recommend it? Oh, yes. Okay. Well, one of the things that came out to me, okay, is uh, sometime in the book, I don't remember if it was at the beginning, but I think it was at the beginning, where he says that because his style of play, because of his style of play, he knows that he needs to be in a superb physical condition. He needs to take that of his, that of his mind. He knows that sometimes he needs to be out there for three, four, maybe even five hours. So he needs to be able to perform the way that he played with that physical game that he had for five sets. So that's the mentality that we need to have. Also, that's not the only top athlete that I heard. I don't like to use it too much because of what happened recently, but Tiger Woods, I also heard said the same thing, that he had to be ready to play 36 holes in one day and, and have you know all that. But Rafa, who is in our game, do you remember him say, saying that? So Rafa, he works extremely hard. He's part of his confidence on that. Do you think he's the only one of the top players that does that? You guys seen Djokovic recently? Federer at 33 years old. Uh, Serena Williams at uh, 33 years old. So, so that's part of our job. Depending on the age that they are, okay? Is, is how, how good in physical condition are. But our goal is for them to be in the, first, in the best possible physical condition that they can to play at the level that they, they want to play and that they, they supposed, to, 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 supposed to play. Some of the important things of being in, in super physical condition, and, and, and Mark mentioned it, you know, the agility, the balance, the coordination, the, what is called the ABC, ABC, this is something that needs to be worked probably every time they go on the court, you know, or they finish with the, with the, with the practice. The speed, the strength, the flexibility, and the, the footwork, okay? All those things. Um, the footwork, something that is very, very important, and, and I'm gonna touch depending on when they do the growth, Footwork might change from year to year. It could change sometimes from 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 few months to few months, depending how they are developed. How many of the kids you know you have, and they gain three, they gain three or four pounds, or they gain one or two inches, and the footwork is not the same as it used to be. They might be a little bit late. The point of contact might be a little a little bit late. You know, now they, they you know they they, they they don't have to stand. They don't have to get up too much to hit the toasting because. You know, they, they, they have different height, different different things. And then also the footwork, we as a coaches, we need to show them how the footwork is different in in different surfaces. Okay. This is something that the, 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 the kids sometimes they have what's called tunnel vision and because they think they do well on hard court, they're gonna do the same way to clay court. And I don't know how many of you have had the chance to play on grass. Can I see a show of hands? How many of you had a chance to play that? Okay, so it's completely different. I mean, the grass, in my days when I used to play, I had the chance, I was lucky enough to play all four grand slams, okay? Uh, and on my days, for a couple of years, the grand slam, we had three grand slams on grass. Okay, we had the, we had the, the Australian Open, we had Wimbledon, and the US Open, they were on grass. So on my days, and nobody told me this, you know, when I first started to start playing on grass, I grew up on hardcore. I, when I play on grass, I didn't do a split step when I serve a ball. I went straight up. Why? Because if you do a split step and that ball bounces on your feet, you weigh a big piece of pen. So this is one of the things that I tell you. It's different to slide on a, a red clay court than a green clay court. It's different to slide, and nowadays the, the kids are even sliding on the hardboard. I don't recommend that, but that's, <laughs> that's up to you guys, you know. So, so that's important. So, so the adjustment of the footwork is key for us coaches.
to make sure that we are aware also in the transition of the of the year from from the kids. Okay. Uh, also, I think somebody had a question here about nutrition. I play I play nutri nutrition is play at the highest level. Okay. Mark mentioned. Okay. I always compare the body of our student as a formula of one car, even though it's even more complex at all. If you put the wrong fuel, you might have a formula one car, but it's not gonna be able to develop the speed if you put, I think, or blue, blue gas. Okay. If you put that special gas they play that is probably more expensive, then that car would would work at his potent at the potential of the car. So, so it's the same thing, same thing with the kids. So we coaches, we need to be aware. That's why I say we might not be at home every time, but we need to be aware of the daily nutrition. Okay? Daily nutrition. I have a 17-year-old that is a pretty good, pretty good a, a, a player. Okay, he's a decent player. Very good. We tell you, he has never had a hamburger of his life. Wow. I'm not joking, my wife is here. He has wow. never had a hamburger of his life. Basically, he eats chicken nuggets pretty much every day, pizza, okay. My oldest son was telling us last last night, uh, last night that my wife brought some, some, uh, some uh, 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 cinnamon roll, and that he said, this tastes funny. He had, he had uh, uh, berries, he had, no, he had raisins. raisins, he had raisins, so he, so this is what I tell, tell, I mean, it's important for us to be, to be involved in the daily nutrition. Okay, there is nothing wrong for you guys to, to go into the internet and find out what is the best thing for them to have on a daily basis. And then when you have your parents meeting and talk to the kids, uh, talk to them about that. But the most important thing is to sell the kids on what the daily nutrition is. If we don't sell it to them, the parents can talk, talk to them until they turn blue. It's not gonna work. But that's very important. That's the starting of the daily nutrition. So you have also pre-competition meals, okay? I host an ITF tournament in my facility, and these kids are between the ages of 13 and 18. And we we used to give we we, we, we give them a, a coupon to go to a restaurant nearby. Okay. And I went over there one day and I asked him, what do these kids eat? And they said they don't eat anything dry. These kids, most of them, they were, of course there were some, they eat salad, you know, the, the chicken is, 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 uh, is grilled. Uh, you know, they don't have sweets, you know, they, 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 they are, the they, they kids that play ITF, they know about these three competition meals better than I think of a lot of our kids. You know, it's completely, they know how to eat in advance. One of the things that I noticed, they also like Subway a lot. They think that Subway, so we as a coaches, we need to be involved with that. And sometimes we might have something to do if we go with a group of kids or with a kid to a tournament, then we can see some of these things, in the, in the, some, some of the things, what that they do. Okay, post-competition meal, same thing, okay. Idea, idea is that they eat within 45 minutes after when they finish, higher in carbohydrate, okay? Very little, very little uh, uh, sugar or no sugar at all, especially if they have another match, okay? And it makes a difference. If they finish for the day, they might have some proteins there, but carbohydrate is the, is the, is the most important, is the most important. Also, hydration, I mean, this is something that is extremely important and we need to be involved in that. That's something that we need to, we need to be watching with, when we're training our kids to see how they hydrating, not only during, during the, the, the practice, but after when they finish. So this is very important. I'm not gonna tell you, uh, you know, you, you guys probably know, I see some Gatorade here, I had, I had a power day. In my days growing up, I gotta tell you this story here. I gotta tell you, uh, when they did that test to me, they did those tests to me, they found out in my blood that I was, that I was propensed to cramps. That I had cramps, and I had, had cramps. I played a few times, the first time I won a match in Davis Cup, right after I finished my match, I was 
16 years old, I got cramps in my stomach and all that, and, and, and you know, took me a while to recuperate. Thank goodness I didn't have to play the ball the next day, but even the, the third day, I was still sore. And they found out when I had cramps. So after when, when they did that, that, that test to me, on those days, we didn't have get it ready. We, we knew, they knew a little bit of, 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 of electrolyte, and, and two things they did. One, they gave me a special preparation <coughs> that it had a lot of electrolytes, you know, and, and, and all that. And then, before I played daily stroke, they gave me a shot of vitamin D. So that way my muscle would be more resistant to that. Okay, based on that, based on that, and I can tell you that it worked, uh, probably none of you know this, I played the most games ever in a Davis Cup match. I play 100 games in a Davis Cup match against Harry Fritz from Canada in Venezuela. It was, it was, for a while, it was the longest match in the history of Davis Cup. Then it became the same one. Then this year it was broken in six hours and 43 minutes. Leonardo Meyer from Argentina for Berlucci for six hours and 33 minutes. But they only play 73, 73 games. We play 100 games. That record still and most likely is not going to be broken on those days there were no high break uh, unless unless uh, unless uh, Isner played Masur on Davis Cup that, that <laughs> match probably was there, is there. So I played for six hours and 13 minutes and I didn't have a cramp. I felt good and I finished with that match. When I went to, to recheck and for the massage after that, I've lost a little bit over five pounds, but two and a half kilos. About, about almost almost six pounds. And not only that, next day I had to come back. I was playing double that day and I had to play five sets again that day. And you know, thanks to that preparation that we had and the electrolyte that I was drinking and all that, I was able to play the next day. By the, by the way, I lost that match of uh, 100 games, but I won the, the doubles the next day. So, so it, worked out, it worked out for me. Okay. Uh, Just had 
a few weeks ago an excellent example of, of, of this. First, uh, in the finals of the French Open, when, uh, when Djokovic lost to Warinka, uh, for a while Djokovic had him, and then also Warinka was able to solve the solve the, the problem there, and then Djokovic, I personally, I'm not a, a, I'm not, I'm not a doctor in psychology or anything like that, but I personally think that Djokovic could not control the emotions that he had of trying to win, you know, the French Open, so he could have his career canceled, and Warinka was able to control the, the situation, okay? Then what it was this year, three weeks after, he was able to control his emotions, you know, he realized I gave him my best on that day, and then he was able to win Wimbledon, you know, three weeks after a major disappointment in his, in his tennis career. I, 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 I would say. And at one time, at the end of the second set, I know that we all saw that he got to, the, to check to his side, he ripped his shirt, and he was cussing and, you know, talking to his box and all that. But that time, he was able to control his emotions. He was able to control his emotions, okay? Uh, so, 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 you know, this is very, very important. Uh, the emotions, I think, is one of the driving forces of the performance of our players. And my dad told me at a very long, young age that the day that somebody invented excuses, Everybody came out okay. Because if you go in in a situation, even if it's a perfect day, the people can say it's too hot, it's too cold, the wind, they gave me a bad call. They can find any kind of excuse. So so you know the emotion is what it controls the rest of, of the of the playing situation. Second is the mental side. And the mental side, I think. This is easy to say, but very difficult to do, okay? I think one of the things that we need to work with our kids is to teach them to be in the here and now. Know what's gonna happen if I win the next point. Know what happened, what happened in the game before. They cheat me, I had an easy forehand volley and I hit it at the net. But I go again, this is a lot easier said than done. But what I have learned Okay, through the years is that the same way that, that you have your kids practice your forehand, your backhand, your second serve, you gotta practice your mental side. Okay, you gotta practice and show them what, it, what is important is to stay in the here and now and play that point as it's the most important point of the whole of the whole time. But again, this is easier said than done. This is very difficult to do, and even the pros. I tell you again, even the pro Djokovic in the final of the French Open, I think his mind start wondering, he start thinking what he was going to say, you know, when he got the trophy and how he was going to feel and his emotion and the mental side got a, a, a little bit of, a, a, a away from him and Warinka realized that situation and he emph emphasized that. Also, let me tell you, Sarina is, you know, when she controls her emotion, I think we all agree she's the very best player in the world right now. The only person that can beat Sarina is Sarina. At the moment, there is nobody out there that realistically can beat Sarina. She can control her emotion. And again, you know, I'm here saying it, criticizing probably the greatest player of all time, or not criticizing, saying, but if she can control her emotion, her mental part, there is nobody that, that, that can beat her. So that's very important. Okay. Um, also, we as a coaches, we need to be very aware of what are the routine of our players, you know, before and after every point. We need to realize, you know, what do they need to do to be in the here and now before they're gonna play the point and how to get to the here and now right after when we, when we, finish, when we finish the point. Uh, I'm sure you guys, uh, Dr. Jim Lair, the famous Dr. Jim Lair, he's a sports psychologist, but he's a tennis, tennis player. He's a tennis player, and he's, he started his sports psychology in tennis. He has become big times, big times now, and, but he started his group in tennis. 
he invented a few years ago what is called the 16 second cures. It's what you have to do in the 16 seconds after when the poem finishes. Win or lose. Look it up in the internet. Excellent video, it's still up to date. And when you see the players, the players, they do that. I gotta tell you another story here. I was at in, 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 in Palm Spring at the tournament this year, uh, this year in, uh, in uh, uh, Indian Wells, okay? We, we, uh, I gave a presentation during the tennis corners and manager company for the TIA over there. And that night we got invited to the owner's box, okay, very nice. And we are ordering a drink, I'm not, I'm next to Gene ordering a drink, and he gets a text, okay? He gets a text on his phone, and he says, uh, that player was playing Eastner the next match. And he says, uh, can you come to my hotel room? I need, to, I need for you to read four certain things. And at the bottom, I think I can say this, at the bottom was said, sign no. It was Djokovic. Dr. Jim Lair, he cannot publicize like he thinks I can. He worked with some of the top players. I don't know how many of you knew that. He worked with uh, Djokovic on the mental side. And then, and then uh, the next day, uh, Djokovic did, uh, did uh, his never, I think it was pretty easy. But, you know, he gets the training. And I'm sure, the reason I tell you this is because I'm sure that Djokovic knows about that 16 second cures after every point and about his routine. So look how many times he bounces the ball, look what he does before and after the point. If one day the Federer does it, Nadal do it, they all, they, all, they, they might not as a different thing, they, they all know that. So we gotta, gotta be able to, to help our kids with that situation, okay? Um, um, you know, I talk about Nadal. I talk about Nadal in his book. And I've been lucky enough to see some of the greatest players of all times playing live. Okay. I was able something in particular like that, very close, close set. Uh, in the women's, I don't know if you guys remember, Steffi Graf. I mean, she was fantastic. She knew how to solve the situation where she wasn't playing her best. And, and, and Sarina is pretty good too, but I've seen Steffi better in, in that situation, okay? Now, we're almost at the end, and I want to talk about the team and the bar, okay? You know, believe it or not, our players have a team around them, around them. You are part of the team. You are probably a very, part of, very important part of the team, but it's, it's very important that even though we don't get involved in everything, we should know a little bit about everything and everything that they do, you know, that, that what I told you at the beginning, okay? So, one of the things that we need to do to put all this together is know the periodization of our players in all these stages, you know? And in the periodization, you have what is called the preparation stage, Preparation stage should be depending if they have a major tournament, it should be somewhere between six and eight weeks before the tournament, okay? And we work in all these areas, the technique, tactic, nutrition, preparation, uh, all these things that, that we do, okay? Then you have the pre-competition stage. The pre-competition stage normally is about two weeks before they do. Let me give you an example. If you're working in certain tactics, you want them to play sets using those tactics. If you're working in something, the technique, you want them to play sets and be under, under those tough situation two weeks before to see how it works. It's not the same like playing a tournament. Sometimes they might play a pre-tournament, you know, they might play a pre-tournament to see how these things are, how these things are working in a, in a situation. One of the best free tournaments that but we can see the Pro Tour are those tournaments that are two weeks before Wimbledon. You know, you have the French Open, now they have three weeks. You have uh, uh, Queens, a lot of the players play Queens, you know, play Halle, and what is the other one? There are three tournaments now in the men's that are, 
and the woman tackle. That's what they're doing. That, that's the, the pre-competition talk. Okay. Then during competition, everything should be in place. You know, and if we are with them in the tournament, we gotta make sure that everything as much as we can is in play. But at the same time, if they have worked in that resiliency, if things don't go the way that they want it to go, we help them. And they gotta they gotta deal with that with that with that situation. Okay. And then post competition is evaluating how they went in the competition and then help them what is the next step? What do we need to do? Do we need to take a step back to, to improve certain things or we continue going forward so that way they can they can become better? Okay. Also, part of the team, the family, very important. The parents, very important. The brothers and sisters, very important. They gotta be part of that team. Sometimes, sometimes they try to they try to stay a little bit away, but most of the time what happens with the parents, they wanna be right there at the front. So we need to learn how to deal with this thing. The more they know about how the whole the whole situation works and about how your program works, the better it's gonna be for you coaches. Okay. The school, okay. We need to we need to also guide guide our kids to do well in school because if no that team is gonna be out of sync. If the kid doesn't do well in school, if they're doing great in tennis and the parents are school oriented, they're not gonna let them play tennis. You guys agree with me? Or they're gonna make them study more. So part of your part of your job as a coach is to make sure that they're doing well, well in school. Okay. Um, the facility where you are, make sure that the environment is welcoming and everything is in good play. You know, if you have different court court surfaces, have them playing different court, court, uh, court surfaces. Make sure that that also the the, the, the the people in the facility are part of the team. They might be a, not a direct part of the team, but they might be an indirect part part of the team. Okay, their friends. Okay, you want to make sure that they, of course, if they are playing tennis at a competitive level, most likely their friends are going to be are, are going to be a, a tennis players. You know, one of the things that I'm looking when when I see the kids is that they have the kids that, that have their same objective and at the same time that they are positive. They don't, they don't make a big deal out of losing, okay? Hey, other things, you know, this is important also, you know, the, the economical the situation of the kids, you know, if there is problems somewhere, you know, make sure that their equipment is in the best possible, possible situation, situation that, that they have, you know, that in their house, the things are working well, not only with the parents, but with the siblings, you know, and in the school, you know, that they are not being bullied in the school, and at the same time, that, you know, that, 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 that they are good kids, okay? Because to finish, to finish, okay, to finish this, okay, our goal as a coach, okay, is to try for our kids to reach their potential as players. But even more important, our goal, is to make tennis their lifetime sport so they can become great kids, great citizens, and even better people for the rest of their life. And we have, we have the opportunity with tennis to be that driving force for us to make these kids the best possible citizens of this world that we can. Okay? So with that, I open it for some questions. I got a couple of minutes for questions. And I hope this gives you an idea. So if anybody has any questions. Well, thank you very much. Again, thank you for